So now about today's um, program. Uh, Jensen Harris is the lead program manager on the Microsoft Office user in experience team and is one of the key designers behind the new user interface being introduced in Microsoft Office. He joined Microsoft in 1998 and has contributed to a number of products for Windows and Macintosh, including leading the redesign of Outlook 2003 user interface. He has focused on the overall UI model for Microsoft Office since 2003. Uh, Jensen writes a great blog um, called the Office User Interface blog. I think it's pretty much one of the best usability blogs out there. He writes in a really open and honest fashion about the design decisions make, and he covers a variety of issues. How many people read his blog? So a bunch of you know this. <laughs> if you don't subscribe to it, try it. It's great. I uh, really enjoy it. If you write about, uh, just a note, if you write about today's event, please use the tag Bekai. We like to follow the conversation about Bekai events through Technorati or some other blog search engine. Um, also, Jensen has kindly agreed to let us podcast today's event, so that will be available on the Bekai site uh, tomorrow, and you can subscribe to our podcast feeds as well. Um, once again, a quick reminder that we are doing questions using these index cards, and we will be collecting them, so please write them down clearly. And with that, Jensen Harris. Well, a big, uh, a big thanks to Rashmi for having me and for, for you guys for having me down at Bay Chi. Um, I do work in, uh, at Microsoft campus in Seattle. So uh, it's actually interesting that the first place uh, I come talk about Microsoft Office is down here at Bay Chi and not at Seattle Chi. And so that's a testament for you guys really being on top of things. So uh, uh, Rashmi said, said most of it. Uh, I have worked at Microsoft since 1998, worked on Macintosh and Windows software. Um, occasionally, people may remember a, a really stupid website that I owned in college called Mediocre Site of the Day, which to give you an idea of uh, how big the web has gotten since then, at, at one point that was one of PC Magazine's top 50 websites. Uh, soon after that, I lost uh, all the code. I have no idea where it is, and it's not even in any of the web archives. Pretty much quit it, you know, at, at that time. But, you know, how amazing that, uh, you know, the web went from so stupid to so interesting in, in such a small amount of time. So, how many of you in the room uh, have used Microsoft Office? <laughs> okay, so you've heard of my product. <laughs> uh, Microsoft Office is a really huge uh, umbrella for you know, a, a large amount of software. Um, most familiar, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook and Access. There's also servers and, and things like that. Uh, but the team I work on is called the user experience team. And we're a shared team, meaning we don't work on just uh, one of the applications. And uh, we're responsible for the user interface of Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Access, and Outlook. Uh, Microsoft Office is one of the most used applications in the world. Uh, we say we have 400 million users. That would be 400 million people who paid us. Um, who knows how many other people have you know, downloaded it through BitTorrent or, or shared it or, or whatnot. But um, there's a lot of people that use, that use Microsoft Office. Um, the current version in the marketplace is Office 2003. Um, I work on the Windows version of Office, so everything you're going to see here today um, corresponds to the Windows version of Office. There is, of course, a team that works on the Macintosh version, uh, who we do talk to, and, and they are thinking about the user interface as well. But today you're going to see um, everything that I talk about is going to refer to our next version of Office, which is codenamed Office 12. Um, it's uh, a product that we've been working on for about two years now, and we're planning on shipping it next year. Um, everything you see in demos today um, is going to be Office 12 Beta 1. So why am I here? Well, the biggest reason is we're making a big bet on the user interface of Office 12. Um, we're breaking away from the time-tested model of menus and toolbars which, as you'll see, has been in office for 20 years. Um, there are elements of new interaction design. There are elements of, of uh, reorganization and information organization in Office 12. And uh, this is really a huge, huge risk for us, 
maybe the single biggest risk we've ever taken in user interface at Microsoft. Um, so we're really hoping that it's going to pay off, um, but it is, it is a, a big risk and it's um, you know, interesting for Office to be out in front on this because we do have a tradition of being very conservative. Um, I've worked on the user interface of Office for just this release. Uh, my background is uh, on Outlook for, for Windows and, and for Macintosh. So this is the first time that, we, uh, that I've worked on the user interface of Office. And uh, this is the first time we've really had a big team devoted just to user experience issues in Office that has owned the experience across all of the apps. So that's one of the ways in which this is a pretty unique release for us. So our top design goals, um, very simple. You know, make, this, make the software easier to use. Now that's an umbrella statement that you know, maybe doesn't have a lot of meaning. Um, but I think as you'll see as the presentation goes on, there are a lot of ways in which Office is not sufficient today, that it's not easy to use, that people have problems with it. The second thing is we know is if software helps you save time, then it's worth upgrading to. And uh, so we're very concentrated on helping people save time. We want people to discover more of what Microsoft Office can do, um, more of that you know, functionality that, that is in there, we want to help people be more productive. And lastly, we really want to help people make great looking documents. So much of what you see people make with Microsoft Office you know, looks like it came out of sort of the 1980s. You know, CGA style, you know, 16 color palettes and you know, sort of bad fonts and sort of bad layout. And so we really want to help people do better. So the agenda tonight, very simple. Maybe the shortest agenda ever. Why are we doing a new UI? And what are we doing? And then plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, traditionally, I wouldn't be here talking to you. This is not normally how Microsoft has done things in the past. And um, we really thought it was important to have this dialogue in the you know, user interface community and with customers about this, this user interface shift because it is such a, uh, such a big change. So that's part of the reason that I've been blogging about this. It's part of the reason why I'm here and why sort of nothing is off limits in terms of the questions you can ask and you know, the answers I, I'll give you. So you know, when you write the, the, you know, your index cards out, feel free to, to ask anything. So why do a new user interface for Office at all? Well, a couple of reasons, right? And as you'd expect, Microsoft is a company and we have business challenges. So the first, the first thing is sort of the conventional punditry that you see in the press or we all say to each other, right? Like, oh, Office is good enough. You know, everything I ever needed in Office was in Office 95, 97, 2000. Actually, that number has continued to creep up the longer I've been at Microsoft, but it's, you know, N minus two or three releases. Um, people only use 5% of what's in Office, right? If I just had bold and italic and underline, I'd pretty much be set, right? This is, this is what, what people say about, about Office. And then we go talk to real people, something that we do all the time. Or I'm on a plane sitting next to a person using Excel yesterday and you know, got an hour earful and a lot of questions <laughs> about that. I always make it a point when I see people using Office on the airplane to ask them how it goes. Sometimes that's a pleasant conversation, sometimes it's not. Um, but these are both quotes from yesterday on my Alaska Airlines flight from Seattle. Um, the woman uses Excel in her job many hours a day, um, used Excel for a long time, and she had all sorts of workarounds that, in fact, she'd written on index cards that she carried in her laptop about how to get certain things done. And she felt very apologetic about, you know, the ways in which she's had to, in her mind, hack around Excel. You know, like, man, I wish there was a better way of doing this. And I'm sure there is, but I just can't figure out how. Um, and we don't ha hear her saying, no, I don't want to learn anything more. She's actually saying, man, Office is complicated, and I would do better at my job if the software made me look smart, if I knew how to use it more. Um, you know, one of the examples is she needed to draw lines, sometimes in Excel, between one piece of data and another. And she actually used PowerPoint to draw a line, copy it into Excel, paste it into Excel, and, and that's how she drew lines in Excel. Well, some of you are chuckling because you know Excel can draw lines. 
Half of you are saying, I'm not sure if Excel can draw lines or not. <laughs> I don't know if, if, that's, if that's a feature request or, and, and, that's sort of, and that's sort of the problem, right? That's, you know, it's, it's good enough. Office is only good enough in the sense that people have made peace with it. And we haven't changed it enough that people have, you know, there's ever been an opportunity for them to sort of be more successful. Um, yet, is Office done? Is it as good as it can be? Have we reached the pinnacle of the software that people use to get their job done every day? I don't think so. And I think that it's, it's pessimistic to think that, that we're not at the very beginning of understanding how to make this software great. But before we look at the future, we must look at the past. And so I want to take you through the old museum of Office past. Starting with Word for Windows 1.0. So it's interesting when I tell this story normally, I say, well, where did this start? Where did, where did, you know, where did menus and toolbars come from? Well, interestingly enough, here. <laughs> the story starts right here at Park, the Palo Alto Research Center. Um, this is a place where, as you know, so much of the fundamentals of, of computer-human interaction were invented, later stolen in parts by Apple, later stolen in parts by Microsoft, later adapted by everybody. Um, and Word for Windows, a piece of software that started development in 1986, uh, 20 years ago, looked something like this. It's designed for 640 by 480. Um, as you can see, it had uh, two toolbars. It's actually interesting enough, one of them was called a toolbar, and one of them was called a ribbon, which will be interesting when, uh, when you see what we call our new UI. Um, but it has the standard you know, menus, menus that you, uh, you're familiar with. And when you actually drop down the menus and look at what they look like, you can understand why Word 1.0 was pretty easy to use. Um, format actually has the most of any men most menu items uh, than anything other than file. <laughs> There's four things on it. There are no more toolbars than are what are on the screen. Right? So Word 1.0 was our first attempt at a word processor. And it kind of sucked, and not a lot of people bought it, which is uh, why we put a lot of effort into Word 2.0. And this is the first version for Windows that really anyone used. Um, it has the same two toolbars that Word 1.0 had, but you'll notice that the menu structure was revamped. File, Edit, View, Insert, Format, Tools, Table, Windows, Help. This is a product in development in 1989 that has the exact same menu structure of Word 2003 today. Right? What was the world like in 1989? Right? What were computers like? You know, I was 13 and in seventh grade when, when this offer was released. Um, and yet, from then till now, the menu structure was cast in stone, right? This, this is it. Um, Word 6.0 was the last 16-bit version of Word. And this began the, the complexization, if I may coin a word, of, of Word as the, the march to add features. So here we had 800 by 600 resolution as the standard. So as you can see, we, we beefed up the toolbars. We put more things on them. And in fact, we introduced more toolbars that weren't on the screen. So there's actually eight different toolbars that you could turn on in Word 6.0. Um, this is a version where we added tooltips, um, uh, the ability to put toolbars on the bottom of the screen. But uh, this is really still the, the beginning of adding the features to Word that everyone sort of knows and loves. So take us to uh, take us to 1995, right? This is the, the Microsoft uh, Word 95, the first 32-bit version, and really this was nothing but a port of uh, Word 6 for 32 bits, plus one feature, which is probably the only feature that you would say you wouldn't go back to use the version before it because it's so cool, and that's red squiggle spell checking, right? That was essentially the only feature that this that this release had. Um, besides this 32-bitness. Now, <laughs> get it out. <laughs> Boo, hiss, yay, clap, cheer. While a small portion of the Office team worked on Word 95, or, and you know, I'm using Word here, but of course there was a full suite of 
you know, Excel, PowerPoint as well. Um, really, the majority of the Office team worked on Office 97. The two releases happened at, the, at sort of the same time. And Office 97 had a lot of features in it, right? It had a, a huge amount of features. The number of toolbars went from 8 to 18, just in Word itself. Um, this is the introduction of command bars, which is sort of our way of having menus and toolbars be the same thing. So this was the first release in which if you wanted your menu bar to be on the left side of the screen, I guess you could have it. Um, the introduction of the Office Assistant, otherwise known as Clippy, was introduced in this version as well. So now, step forward to 1999 and Word 2000. So one of the things that you have to remember is that Word 97 was a blockbuster release, and virtually everyone had to eventually upgrade to it because we changed the file formats. And we didn't do a good job of bridging that gap. So virtually everyone, you know, we, we, we've learned our lesson a little bit, but people, people were forced to, to upgrade to Word 97. And so the, the stories in the press that got written about Word 97 featured one word prominently, bloat. Right? So this is hard to believe because this is the same version that you're telling me, man, I wish I could go back to the good old days of you know, Word 97. But at the time, all anyone was saying about it was it's bloated. It has too many features, the UI seems bloated, you know, it had all these extra toolbars. And so the user interface team at that time really took that to heart. And what they set as their goal was to reduce their perception of bloat. Now, there's a number of ways that they could have attempted to change the user interface to reduce the perception of bloat. They could have developed a new UI, but, but Office you know, was very conservative, and Office wanted to stay with the UI that they had. So they introduced more workarounds to the, to the menu and toolbar system. So the first one is the hated short and long menu uh, contraption in Word 2000, which is to say you start with a short menu, and then you sort of hover over it long enough or do some magic or wave your mouse at the bottom, and it opens up and shows you more stuff. So, yeah, so this is sort of like, we'll make the, make the product easier to use via hiding stuff from you, but only sort of, right? And you start at the top and you scan down, and then you can imagine opening it up and continuing to scan down, but no, they open up in place. So you actually have to scan the entire menu back from the top no end of confusion. Luckily for us, uh, you know, hardly any companies in the world deploy with this feature turned on, so it hurt you know, virtually no one other than normal people at home. <laughs> the other wonderful thing was, well, let's, let's make the toolbars feel less bloated, and the way we'll do that is not give each of them their own line. So we'll actually stack them sort of next to each other, and then we'll put a little arrow here that has the fly-offs of the things here. And that's pretty confusing, but it'll all sort itself out because it's automatic, right? The, the computer looks at the things you use the most and moves them around on you all the time. So <laughs> that'll solve it. It'll self-optimize. Uh, needless to say, this resulted in you know, no fewer than 105 million phone calls about how come my font you know, isn't on the screen and what happened to bold and you know, the computer took care of it, don't worry. <laughs> so all of those things were kind of disastrous and we sort of reached the end of, of our ability to innovate in menus and toolbars. So we invented the task pane. The task pane says, you know, our features aren't getting noticed, but I bet they would if we built a whole new rectangle and put the new features in there, right? So this is good. So now we're not going to put anything new in here. This is sort of dead, and we're going to leave all, all that the way it was, but we've created a new rectangle. So now notice we have 30 toolbars already, 30 toolbars in Word. And keep in mind, each of these is probably 10 to 30 16 by 16 unlabeled icons, right? So, you know, keep in mind that this is not just 30 features. This is like 200 features. But we're going to add eight task panes, right? So this is good. So now all of our new features will get found. And so fast forward to the current version, Word 2003. 
Well, what happened? Well, predictably, we added 11 more task panes in Word 2003. Well, now people can't find the features in the task panes. So we built a menu of all the task panes over here. <laughs> right? So where, where, where is this going? Um, so <laughs> yes. Um, so this, this is where we were you know, three years ago. Um, you know, we're at the point where we, you know, we have a piece of software that has been developed over a lot of years. We tried to mitigate the, you know, the problems with menus and toolbars, the, the complexity there by, you know, adding contraptions. We invented new rectangles. Um, and when we started the planning for Office 12, um, we looked at it, and, and I'll show you in a second, it looked like we would have about 100 new task panes in Office 12, right? That's where the, the curve was going. The other thing that I think is interesting is when you look at the back of the box for Word 2003, you know, it looks like this. When we go visit it on people's machines and actually look at how they end up using it, it looks more like this, right? Because the UI is extremely sort of customizable and things pop up all the time and you don't know why and you have to bring toolbars up to find features but there's no real way to, to there's no motivation to get rid of them people's screens end up looking like this and one of the primary questions we get from people is how can i get rid of these things to get you know less than like a postage size you know, postage stamp size document in the middle um, so it was clear to us that we needed to do something here so tracing back, if we look at the number of menu items in, in Word, you can see that it went from, from under 50 in the first version to almost 300 in the current version. Um, you look at toolbars, and again, this is the number of toolbars. So each one of these you know, accounts for a bunch of unlabeled 16 by 16 icons. Um, there's a lot, almost 35. And then you look at we, the introduction of task panes and trace where this curve is going. And imagine the next release is here, right? So when we took over Office 12, the team was talking about how do we manage all these task panes and we need to build a more complicated task pane manager to handle all the task panes and maybe we need another task pane on the left that we could put different features in. So why, why have a new user, inter user interface? Why have a new user experience? Well, it's not because menus and toolbars are bad at all, right? Like they were perfect for Word 1.0 and Word 2.0, for software that had many fewer features than, than today's software. But the feature set of Office has stretched them beyond the limit. Our software is so rich that it can't be, uh, it can't be as easily communicated using menus and toolbars. So you may say, well, the solution is you just shouldn't add so many features. And you know, maybe that's the case, but we, the list of features people ask us to use or ask us to add to the pro product is a mile long. And in fact, we don't add features willy-nilly. We don't do them because you know, they're cheap. They're very expensive to build, and they get more expensive the more features are in the product. So we take it to heart very much. You know, we have these huge number of customers saying they need this feature. So we work hard, we add it to the product, and then no one finds it. Right? So the result is it's really hard to find functionality compared to a decade ago. You find a lot of people saying, you know, there must be a way to do this. I don't even know where to start looking. One of the things that really brought this to mind for me was one of the first things we did when we started working on uh, Office 12 was we asked the product support team for Word to give us their list of top 10 requested features. You know, from people just calling in and saying, hey, I wish I had this feature in Word. We got the list, and to my surprise, four of them are already in the product, right? All of the features that people are asking for are features that we've already built, and people can't find them. The UI is keeping them from, from exploring the power of what the product can do. Again, menus work great when this is what your menu looks like. Right, menus were designed in the 70s for, for products that did a lot less than, than Office does today. You know, when this is your UI, your UI, where do you put the next control? Right? Where's the next gauge gonna go? 
right? The only thing we have left is to put it on the windshield. And that should be the most important, that should be the most important thing, right? You need to be looking out. You need to be looking at your document. That should be the focus. So why now, right? Why, why is this the release when, when, when we should do this? Well, um, part of it is a confluence of complexity that, that I illustrated it. But part of it is we're empowered for the first time to make decisions about the user interface of Office based on something other than just making stuff up or you know, our feelings about how we think people use the software. So with Office 2003, we had uh, built into the software is a thing called the Customer Something Improvement Program, Customer Experience Improvement Program, I think. Internally, we call it SQM, S-Q-M, but you know, marketing named it that. And you may have seen this if you've installed Office 2003, you get a little icon that comes up that says, hey, do you want to make Office better? If you say yes, which a lot of people do, then you, know, you contact the mothership behind, you know, but behind your back, sort of uh, using your internet connection. And they, we get a ton of data about how you use Office. Of course, it's you know, not personally identifiable, and it's private. It's just you know, essentially instrumented data about how, how the things get, get used. So a lot of people wonder where that data goes. Well, it goes into a spreadsheet on my desktop. right? That, that, that's essentially what happens to it. It turns into reports that we get about how people use the software. Um, we've collected 1.2 billion data sessions. We throw a large amount of the data that comes in out because it's, it's too much. Like We don't need it to be statistically relevant. So this is how many we've actually captured. And this is sort of old data, so many billions. We get about 2 million sessions a day that, that we collect. That's about the level at which we keep it. Um, over the last 90 days, we've looked at 352 million toolbar clicks in Word to give you an idea of, of how big this data set is. And we, we collect 6,000 data points. So a data point is just some, a question that we've said as the product designers that we want answered. So we say, we want to know how many folders people have in Outlook. That's a data point. We've got 6,000 of those that we look at. So really, the confluence of data and complexity is the thing that made it so that we could actually build something that we had high confidence might work. Um, in the past, the way feature development worked at Microsoft, and maybe some of the places you work, is whoever sort of could make the case the best about how people did things, or whoever could talk the loudest. I'm pretty tall, and I can sort of talk loud. So I could convince people, you know, people don't use paste. They just don't. I've never seen anyone use paste. My mom doesn't use it. We've never seen, you know, I don't use it. I use control V. I don't even think anyone has ever touched the paste toolbar button. So we say, OK, well, Jensen seems smart, and he's pretty tall, and he's got a loud voice. <laughs> OK, no paste toolbar button. And that's, you know, we send it out in the, in the wild, and sometimes we hear back about it, and sometimes we don't. Now we really know what people are doing and what they're not doing. We can look at the curve and say, actually, you know, of the you know, top commands in the product, Paste is used far more than anything else in Office across all the apps. Paste is by far the most, the most used thing. Way more than copy, way more than cut, way more than bold, way more than save. Why? Well, people are repurposing information. Right? They don't do the cuts and copies most of the time in Office. They do it in the web browser or somewhere else. Right? So here's an example of one of the many ways we have of analyzing this data. This is. Uh, basically what corresponds to the drawing toolbar in Word uh, 2003. And this is just a very simple thing that sort of does like a heat map based on uh, which things get used the most and which ones get used the least. Obviously, we have lots of different ways of slicing this data. More interesting than just like percentages is how are these commands sequenced, right? What are the, what are the chords? What are the things you use together? This thing, then this thing, then this thing equals feature. Right, what, are, what is the natural um, you know, evolution of features together? Which things are used by the toolbar? Which ones are used uh, you know, with mouse clicks? Which things are done by the keyboard? And then you know, the, other, the other data point we always have to do is you know, it's software that is collecting this data, and software has bugs in it. So when something doesn't smell right, we still have to you know, rely on things like you know, news groups and support calls and things like that to sort of verify, it sort of passes the sniff test. 
Um, I remember early on when we built this functionality into Outlook, finding out that the average person had 4,700 folders. Right? That didn't feel right. And it later turned out that we were multiplying things by 100, and it should have been 47. Right? So there's always, you know, whenever there's a computer involved, there's some amount of, of uncertainty. But we do trust a lot of this data um, implicitly. So all of this, we have the data. We have a product that we have to make a decision about. Do we sit on its laurels, sort of run out the clock on Microsoft Office and sort of say, yeah, we're pretty much done? Or do we take a risk? and say, hey, what if we tried to make something better, something that was really better? What if we wiped the slate clean and we didn't have to have menus, and we didn't have to have toolbars? Um, you know, what would we build? So starting over with the clean slate, the very first thing we did was we wrote down our design tenets. These were our rules, right? These were the six things we believe in as the office design team. First one is the focus on the document. There's too many places where UI pops up in Office 2003 and takes your focus away from what you're working on. So for us, we always, always ask, is it worth taking this pixel away from the user? Because right? that's what we're doing. Anytime we build UI, we're just distracting from the task at hand. So is it worth stealing this pixel from the user? Working without interference is something that we talk about a lot. Secondly, really, really big bet on contextualization. You'll hear me say that a bunch of times. But reducing the number of choices um, present at any time is, is a huge, important factor for simplifying the product. Third, efficiency. Um, there's lots of UI that can satisfy other criteria about easy to use and discoverability that are extremely inefficient. And we knew that uh, people wouldn't put up with Office that took massively more clicks, or everything was a wizard, or some sort of you know, UI that was, was very inefficient. It had to be efficient. And even better, it had to increase efficiency. And we have to be able to document that with data. We really thought it was important to embrace the soul of the applications. And a lot of people don't, don't know what that, that means. But I think, I think for me, it means that every program has a thing that it's good at, right? PowerPoint is for presenting and drawing and creating. Excel is for crunching numbers. Yeah, there's a drawing layer in PowerPoint, and yeah, there's a drawing layer in Excel. And consistency is sometimes good, but homogeneity is not, right? Saying that the drawing UI has to be exactly the same in Excel and PowerPoint, or that you know, working with a table has to be exactly the same in two apps means that you end up with least common denominator UI in all of them. And, and so we really, we really wanted to bring out the soul of the program. What is it about? Um, lots of experience in Office with smart, auto-customizing, super pop-up-y you know, UI that, that tries to outsmart you and remove, you know, buttons you were just using. And, and, and we really wanted to build something with a, where features had a permanent home. We weren't going to auto-optimize things. We weren't going to require you to ask a paperclip how to use it. It was going to be a sharp tool. And we're going to build it. And it's always going to work the same way. It's going to be predictable. And lastly, you know, as UI designers, we love to build clever things and contraptions. And we, we wanted to write down, straightforward is better than clever. So whenever we're looking at a design and we start to feel really good about ourselves, that we need to go make sure in the lab that it's straightforward to people and that it feels natural and that we're not just sort of outsmarting ourselves. So th those were our six design tenets. When we looked at, and I promise we're very close to, to doing the demo. Uh, <laughs> when we looked at what was the rallying cry of this release going to be? What was the thing we wanted to get back? That, that sense that, that you used to have that you understood how the software worked. We, we think of that as the sense of mastery. That there was a point of time when you understood what the product could do. You mastered it. That doesn't mean you knew every feature in it and how to use it, but you understood how to find things. You understood that the program was finite and not infinite. 
So we will, everything we do is about trying to get back that sense of mastery. So to us, that meant a single finite space to search for functionality. We know browsing was not going to go away, browsing for features, especially in a program with as many features as Office. So let's make that as good as we can. Contextualization, I'm going to be talking about that a bunch. Um, helping people work without interference is as much about predictability as anything else, that the software works the same on every machine, that you understand the rules that govern it. And finally, um, and the, the fourth thing is important, too, that this is still Microsoft Office. To me, that just means we could have built the most out there thing possible, but we do have a legacy. We do have you know, 400 million people who know how Microsoft Office works. So while we were free to be innovative, you know, we weren't going to be stupid, right? We, weren't, we realized there has to be a comfort level and that someone has to be able to look at it and say, okay, I recognize this. This is still Word. This is still Excel. Um, but last, I, I really think the sort of evocative sense of, you know, we're no smarter, we're probably dumber than the people who first made Word and the people who first made Excel. It's just that we know more than they do now. We know how the products turned out, right? We know what 20 years of features have been built on top of Word 1.0. So sort of what, what do we think the founding fathers of the apps would have built if they would have had the foresight to see how it turned out? So we took the big bet. Our conservative history in user interface, I think, gives us some credibility to make this kind of change. Um, you know, we don't cry wolf all the time. We don't change the UI every time. When we do it, we mean it, and we're very explicit about it. We, and, and me particularly, I have a lot of trust in people that they can learn different ways of using software. If, if nothing else, uh, we were talking at dinner, uh, the proliferation of different websites that have different UIs. Maybe we wish there was more consistency there, and you know, shopping carts work the same way and all that, but people give them credit. If you build something that's easy to use, people figure out how to use it. So we trust that people can make a switch. switch. Big mistake that we made the whole way through all the office up till now. You have to remove things to simplify. Right? In general, this is true. You can't just add and add and add and add and add. Right? You can't build another rectangle, another triangle, another circle, another widget, another menu. It doesn't simplify. It makes it more complex. Now, maybe it makes it easier to use for the short, ter short term, but it certainly doesn't simplify. Right? So we were willing to make the bet to, 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 to throw the old thing away. And this is, for us, um, an opportunity, but it's also a responsibility to our users, to all of you who use it, and to the industry to, to, to try to come up with uh, you know, sort of the, the light by which you know, productivity software can sort of can follow, that we can come up with what is sort of the next, the next thing. And, and the, last, the last thing that blows me away when we got the study about this was when we found out that on average, people who used our software spent 2.6 hours a day, one-on-one, -on -one, in a room with Office. And that doesn't include, uh, like, that doesn't include you know, anything else, web browsing, et cetera. And that people spent 2.4 hours married people with their spouses. Right? Now that sounds you know, sad, in a way. <laughs> and it is. But it also means that you have an intimate relationship with your software. That I'm not saying you want to take it to bed, um, but you know, to the extent that we can make 2.6 hours of your day better or worse, you know, times 400 million, you know, is that is that a bet worth making? You know, we think yes. So with that, we'll start. What What is the new UI? OK, so this part is going to be uh, much more informal. Um, you'll probably see some crashes. That's good. Feel free to applaud or, or boo or commiserate. Um, this is just actually a build that I put, put, on, um, put on the machine from the hotel. And uh, I guess first I'll just bring up, I'll bring up Word. So this is, this is Word 12. Um, it's looking kind of weird up on the screen, but that's okay. It doesn't actually look as washed out as that in, in reality. Um, but one thing that I will say as a caveat, um, the structures and, 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 and things that you see are all um, 
what we intend to, to go with, but the visuals, the actual visual skin, is not the visual skin that we intend to ship with. So, you know, you can, you can cut the, the jokes about the brushed metal and all of that. Um, this isn't actually, you know, what, what we intend to ship. We, did, we built sort of this temporary visual skin um, to exercise the, the new drawing layer, and marketing wanted to save the real skin for beta 2. So, but, uh, but uh, you know, the things that I'm going to show you will all work in the final release. So, as you can see, we have this thing at the top is called the ribbon. And the ribbon is made up of um, a set of tabs, um, which you can switch between, that switches out the ribbon beneath it. So you may say, well, the ribbon looks like a big, fat, ugly toolbar. That's what some people say when they first see it. And it is kind of big. Um, it's about as, it's a little bit smaller than if you had three toolbars up in Word, um, which is not uncommon at all. In fact, most more people have, have more than that. But the important thing here is, this is it. We'll never take more space from you. Nothing ever comes up. No more rectangles, no task panes, no toolbars. Nothing ever comes up. It's a flat tax. We're going to take this amount of your screen and nothing else ever. Right? That's, that's sort of our promise. So the ribbon is really the only home for functionality. If you want, um, you can collapse it down. For you know, when you want just total focus on your document, um, but you know, we think most of the time it will it will it will be up. So just you know, using this sort of normally, one of the things that we we find is that people are very comfortable using it at first, and that's because the things that are on the first tab of each of the apps are somewhat similar to what would have been on the first standard and formatting toolbars of Word 2003. So, for instance, I can you know come in here and I can uh, you know click bold. I can you know change the font. I can change the font size. Uh, you know I can change the font color, um, and all of those things you know are very similar to how you would have used them in the past. This is part of you know making people comfortable. In fact, one of the weirdest things that we get when we bring people into beginners, especially into usability tests, is they inform us they have this version at home and they really like it. <laughs> Evidently, they've been on BitTorrent. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so, so a lot of things haven't, haven't really changed. So, so the, the tabs for each of the apps are different. And this is part of bringing out the soul of the application. So in Word, the first tab is all about writing. Then there's a, a tab, Insert, which is about putting things in your document. Uh, page Layout, uh, which is, you know, about all the page layout features of Word. References, which is all the academic features around table of contents and indexes and footnotes and endnotes and things like that. Mailings, which is, you know, send out your spam mail or your Christmas greeting card, depending on the time of the year. And then review, which is, which is about reviewing documents. So now if I switch to Excel, you see that the, the top level tabs are different. So the first tab is called Sheet. And Sheet is all about the things you do on your spreadsheet. Yes, it includes bold and italic, but it also includes number formats and inserting cells and deleting cells and things like that. It's also an insert tab here. There's also page layout functionality in Excel um, in, this, in this version. Um, but there's a formula tab where we have all of the things about managing formulas and about uh, we've got your Harry Potter books of, of formulas that you can put in, debugging formulas. You've got internal, external data, and you've got review here. PowerPoint is, um, has a different set of things. You've got slides, you've got insert, you've got uh, design, you've got animations, you've got all the things about setting up your slideshow, and you've got reviewing. So as you can see, where there are things that could be consistent, and there's no good reason for them not to be, such as inserting things in the document, they are consistent. They work the same way across the apps. Where there is opportunity to, you know, to specialize, we allow the apps to specialize. The top level set of menus, you know, the top level set of tabs are, are not the same. So with that, I'm going to switch back. What I should have done is just minimize that. And, OK. So the new UI framework 
of, so you'll hear a lot about the ribbon, and you know, Rashi first wrote to me and asked about ribbon UI. It's actually a whole lot, a whole web of UI that makes up the new Office UI. The ribbon is an important part of it, but it's an interlocking set of, of, of new interaction, new design, which um, complements each other. Like all these things were designed together as sort of a full package. I'm not gonna show them all today, um, but I do have a presentation where I show them all, but it takes two hours, so I won't do that. If you have specific things you want to see later, let me know. I'll show more of them than I have now. But realize this is a really big process that goes everything from, you know, the ribbon to a new option, a new scheme for for application options, you know, to a customizable status bar, to keyboard navigation, etc. So the ribbon, as I mentioned, is the primary replacement for menus and toolbars. Um, it's both modeless and modal, depending on how you use the words. It's modeless in the sense that it doesn't, uh, you know, you can browse through it. You can browse through each tab. It doesn't, it's not modal to your document or anything like that. But it is task-oriented in that, uh, you know, each tab is organized around an object or organized around a scenario. Each one of the tabs is organized into something that we call a group. If you're familiar with my blog or anything like that, I call this chunks. I say that these are broken into chunks, which is our internal name, but marketing doesn't like me talking about chunks, so I'll talk about groups now. So each one of these is, is a group. You probably can't see these visuals real well, but each one sort of has a name. This is a group, this is a group, this is a group. Um, each of the groups contains related controls within that tab. Now, one of the advantages of the ribbon is that it can host richer content than menus and toolbars. It, we're actually free to not just put in simple command buttons, but actually things that we would have put in dialogues or put in task panes or put you know, in a different kind of UI in the past. It's rich and it lets us sort of a, a express the UI more than we could in menus and toolbars. The important thing about the ribbon is that it's one home for functionality, right? You start at the leftmost tab and you scan to the rightmost tab. And generally, if it's not in there, then it's not in the product, right? The space is very finite. There are not a bunch of other rocks to go look under. Um, there's enough room to label each command. Um, I've written about this on my blog, so if you've read this, you've heard this story, but one of the things when I was an intern on the Outlook team, between Outlook 97 and Outlook 98, they were trying to improve the usability of the toolbars. Because one of the complaints that they were getting was that People hate that it took three clicks to reply to an email message. And the team was like, I don't understand why it takes three ticks. You just click on the little head with the arrow pointing left, and um, it'll reply to the message you know, on the toolbar. So you know, they tried all sorts of contraptions to try to improve the usability of the, the Outlook toolbars. Then they tried just adding text to them. Well, of course, the, the, the usability, discoverability, of those things blew through the roof, right? Because you know people only recognize a small number of icons, right? You recognize bold, you recognize left justify, you, rec you know center and italic, and maybe you could learn a few more. But labels are really important, um, and one of the reasons that people don't find things in Office is because so many things are just 16 by 16 icons. So we really thought it was important that the ribbon left a lot of room to label things wherever possible. Obviously, it's not always possible. But, but as much as I can. So I'm gonna show you just a, a, a really, really, um, okay. Show you a, just a, a really whirlwind tour of sort of what the, what the ribbon can do. And I'm actually gonna undo through this to get back to the beginning. Okay, so let's go into Excel first. So here is a bunch of just tables of data that I have in Excel. And um, one of the things that we know people do a lot is analyze data within Excel. It's not just about typing it in. So I'm going to select some stuff here. And I'm going to go into this quick formatting chunk. And I'm going to see here that we have a gallery of different ways that I can visualize this data. It's very visual. These features don't even have names, really. And I'll click on them, and you can see that we've generated a heat map for the data underneath this. Similarly, let's say I wanted to come here with this data, and I wanted bars that represent you know, how, how big each of the numbers are. Or maybe I want you know, an icon set that shows 
you know, uh, I guess that one is interesting. You know, which numbers are high, which numbers are low, and which ones are, are sort of medium. Or let's take this big bunch of data down here and let's make it into, you know, let's make this into a table. So now, as you can see, we've got this table here. I can, uh, I can you know, format this, the sorting and all that, it automatically hooked up for me. Um, I can do things like add a total row or get rid of that. I can turn on banded rows and columns. I can, you know, do all sorts of stuff that it would have been really hard to do with Excel. And in fact, the sort of heat map that I showed before, I can just come in here and I can actually overlay that so I can see which, which stores are doing well and which stores aren't doing as well. So one, one aspect of the ribbon is that it lets you get really great results fast, that you don't have to know a lot about how the features work in order to just sort of fool around, and it's very inviting to sort of play with. But another really important part of the ribbon is just sort of how fast it lets you create sort of better documents that you could in the past. So I'm just going to go through in Word, and I've just got some text in here that I pulled off of Expedia or something about Australia. And I'm going to just try to spruce this up a bit. So the first thing I think this needs is a picture. So I'm going to come in here, and I've got this picture of this koala, and I'm going to put this in. So one of the things that is hard about Word is, uh, is positioning pictures within, within, uh, within uh, a run of text. This is normally what you get. And one of the things that you have to know about Word in order to put the text, you know, or put the text wrapping around it, you have to be able to use five different features. You have to know how text wrapping works. You have to know how to align the thing to uh, the margin. You have to know how to, to make the picture not in line, etc. In this case, I can just use the ribbon to come in here and find sort of the positioning that I want for it. In this case, I want it sort of in the upper right-hand corner. I can make this like a little bigger or a little smaller if I wanted. Um, I can come in here and, you know, add a shadow to it. Um, I can add a colored border to it. Um, yeah, that, that looks pretty good. Um, so now I'm going to add uh, page numbers to this. So I'm going to come in here and just choose from this gallery of page numbers. This one looks kind of cool. So eh, I don't like that one. I want one that has page numbers in it. So that one's pretty good. And if when I save my document, it would put the document title in here. And let's see. Now I think it would look better if I... Uh, change this, change the margins of this a little bit to be very wide, but now I can't put as much much text here, so maybe I'll change this to be landscape. And in fact, I'm not ready for all of you to see this yet. It's sort of company confidential, so I'll add a watermark here and I'll choose this confidential watermark. So you can see now it shows confidential behind the text here. Okay, you can't see it because of the projector, but you can imagine <laughs> confidential. <laughs> Um, in this case, you know, maybe I want to put in a text box, like a pull quote about, about Australia. Let me find something here. That, that looks interesting. I could put the text in here. Maybe I want to choose a different style for this. Hmm. Actually, this one looks interesting. That looks sort of nice. To, I can come in here. I can choose a cover page uh, from this. That one looks nice. And you know, as you can see, just sort of playing around with this in a very short amount of time, I've built something that is not entirely embarrassing. Um, and I, you know, in the past, I would have had to use a huge number of different features. I'd had to use a bunch of formatting features, a bunch of alignment features, a bunch of page layout features, some of them very obscure. Um, you know, one of the cool things here, you can, you know, put page numbers on the side. I, you know, challenge you to figure out how to, how to do this in, in, or 2003, although it is possible. You can see the numbers there. Um, but it's just the ribbon is to sort of, you know, play with it, sort of experiment. A uh, lot of galleries, very visual. You can, you, can get a lot of, um, you can get a lot of great results very fast. So one of the questions people always ask is, well, how does it scale, right? So it looks great on this big monitor you have here, but what would it do on someone's machine that has a smaller one? So this is uh, broadcasting at, or projecting at 1024 by 768, which is actually at the, the small end of um, 
what we know through our data that our users have, but we have a lot of users at 1024 by 768. Happily, 1280 by 1024 and above is, is getting bigger, but there'll still be always people on, you know, that are not using the window maximized or they'll be on a smaller machine or be on a smaller resolution. So I'm going to uh, restore this window. Oh, I did it. Okay. Actually, let me uh, zoom out so you can see what's behind it. Okay. Okay. So as I shrink the window down, I want you to watch what the ribbon does. So the first thing to watch is uh, over here, you'll see that a few commands lose their label. You see as I continue down, uh, the layout of this group has changed so that there are fewer big buttons. Um, you can see as I continue to go down, a couple of the, the things have collapsed all the way down to something that we call sort of a pop-up group. And if I um, pop these down, you'll see uh, basically the group as it would appear in here in exactly the same layout that it would have appeared in the ribbon. Once you get below a certain size, we just turn it off altogether. We say that you're probably using this to, you know, copy data for another, you know, for another presentation or something like that. And so, you know, it, it, it uh, comes up and it comes down. One of the cool things about the ribbon is that it doesn't just scale down. So normally the way we used to do UI was to pick a resolution, 1024 by 768, build for that, and then figure out how to scale it down. The ribbon doesn't have a target resolution. In fact, it can scale up. If you have a big monitor, then you'll get more choices, you'll get more labels, you'll get bigger buttons. That we don't just assume that you know, monitor sizes are done now, right? People will get bigger screens. And so the, you can imagine this further unrolling to, the, to where this chunk is no longer a pop-up and more of these things you know, get, get labels. So the ribbon scales down, the ribbon scales up. Um, this doesn't happen automatically. We design this behavior. Um, this is not some algorithm in the computer that decides based on usage or anything like that. We figure out which things, you know, what size each of the chunks works in, uh, what's the priority order that they should shrink down or expand, uh, which things get labels, which things lose their labels first, etc. So there's a lot of intensive design that goes into um, that goes into the ribbon. That's not just, you know, dump a bunch of commands into the computer and, and let it go. Okay, so I pulled out uh, a document from September 2003 as I was looking for content for this. And I came across this success criteria that was how we would know whether the ribbon was successful or not. And I haven't changed this a whit, and some of it, uh, some of it you'll see you know, overlaps other things I've talked about. But I thought it was interesting. Like These are sort of the criteria that we thought we would know we succeeded if we achieved these things. Um, and the, one of the biggest things is that we believe that there will be a learning curve, that the new um, software will require maybe some training, maybe a lot of it you'll be able to figure out on your own, but that it is um, something that we know it will require a little bit of investment. We hope that that investment is by far outweighed by the, the sort of ease of use and ease of discoverability improvements. Um, but it's you know, interesting that you have to take the degradation if you delete things, and you have to delete things in order to simplify. So even from the very beginning, we were sort of willing to say, yeah, there's a hurdle that you have to overcome. We hope it's a few hours and not a few weeks, because we'll fail if it's a few weeks or, or a few months. So contextualization. So zap back to 1995 when context menus um, were first on the Windows platform in Windows 95. From watching usability tests from that era, which are still on video, they couldn't have paid people enough to right click. If they had told people there's a one in three chance that they'd get a pot of gold if they right clicked, <laughs> they wouldn't have done it. Flash forward to 2005, today, we can't keep people from right-clicking. It's the first thing they try every single time whenever we ask them to do anything in the usability lab. Well, why? Well, I think it's, it's obvious. When you have a very complicated program with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of commands, there's only one place where we've scoped those commands down to the things that are actually likely to work, right? And that's the context menu, right? When you right-click on a folder in Outlook, well, you get only the things that apply to the folder. 
And that's probably the thing that you're looking for as compared to going through the hundreds of commands in Outlook looking for where we tucked it. So contextualization is sort of magic. Like people have, have, have latched onto this concept and they're right clicking everywhere. But it's not so much um, because the context menu itself is a great way of presenting functionality. It's, it's because of the concept of contextualization as a high likelihood of success. So the one, of the, one of the things that we did first, and we're like, okay, we're making a new UI for Office. You know, let's start. Now what? Well, I don't know. Well, how many features are there? Well, okay, there's 1,500. 1,500 separate features in Word. Oh, okay, that sucks. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I don't think there's a UI that can hold 1,500 features. Like, we're going to have to break it up. Um, and then we started to look at what they were. Like, what were all of these different features? Well, it turns out that a huge number of them are only possible to use in conjunction with an object. We've got a ton of picture tools and drawing tools and chart tools and diagramming and header and footer and shapes, and, and none of that stuff works unless you have a picture in your document. Right? It's 150 picture commands that you never have to see if you're not putting a picture in your document. And so we realized that this was sort of this was the piece. This is what was going to make this work. And so we invented something that we call contextual tabs. And you saw this a couple times in the demo that I showed. The idea basically is whenever you select or insert an object, whenever an object is in scope, the tabs that relate to that object show up. And here you can see this thing says chart tools, and it has the tools that let you edit a chart. When you, that object goes out of range, the tools put themselves away. Um, now, you might say to yourself, but uh, I, I would really like to go through the chart tools and see them and maybe use them even when I don't have a chart in range. Well, they would all be disabled, every single one of them. All we're doing is hiding disabled tools that you wouldn't be able to see otherwise. So the advantage is the set of tools you need are always at hand. When you've got a picture, then we got the picture tools. The things you don't need are out of your way. So you can imagine how this makes pictures better and makes charts better and makes tables better. But the key thing is, when we looked at what was left, the core product is vastly simplified. And it looks a lot more like Word 2.0. We haven't been adding a whole lot more bold to the product in the last 20 years. And we've added a little. Um, but so you're not just, the important thing isn't just things come when you need it. It's we don't have to show you that stuff when you don't. Contextualization is, if this is one thing you leave here with, it's the magic of contextualization. Figure out you know, how, how to contextualize your product and how to formalize that in the UI, and you'll have drastically simplified it. So let me show you sort of more information about how this works. So doo -doo -doo. let's bring up world's best deck. Why isn't world's best deck showing up? Here it is. OK. So here's a slide. And the insert tab now, now that you've heard about contextual tabs, insert is essentially the list of things you could put in your document. This is the list of things that could have contextual tabs. And so there's a formal relationship between the things here and the contextual tabs. So this is not actually looking like it's supposed to. A lot of the ribbon layouts that you see are still very rough, and we're still working on them. Um, but you sort of get the idea. And we just passed a, a smoking ban for all the restaurants in Seattle um, that just went into effect yesterday. So I'll draw a huge no smoking symbol for my new sign. So as I did that, I inserted it, and the object got selected, and something that says drawing tools showed up. So the drawing tools show up because the, pic because the drawing is now selected. And this has all of the things that I use to format my drawing. If I click away from here, you'll see that the drawing tools put themselves away. If I click back on the object, the drawing tools come back. Now, the cool thing about this is in the past, if we added things like drawing to Excel or drawing to Word, it had to be bad, right? Because it's not important enough to occupy a lot of screen real estate in Excel. We couldn't have made it good because it's not important enough to be good. But with contextual tabs, now we can say, well, 
we know when you're using this that you actually want those tools because that's the most important thing. So we can actually do a good job at everything. We can do a good job with Tables UI. We, can, we have all the space in the world we need. The scalability is, is sort of infinite. That we can say, drawing is great. I can, of course, still use, when this is selected, you know, my other tabs. Like this is just turns into sort of a normal tab. Um, you can see I can come into this gallery here and I can choose, you know, different layout for this. I can choose different, you know, effects, shadows, reflections, grow, glows. There's a, there's a, a totally new drawing engine and, and in all the apps, which is stupendous. I'm not really showing it today, but you can make things that are just out of this world. And contextual tabs are really the key to, to making that work. So what if you have two objects up, which is, which is sort of the next question. So if I were a school teacher and um, I had these, score, these uh, scores for people, you can see now if I click in the table, that the table tools come up and you know this lets me you know format the table etc and this up here is also a table that says overall assessment needs improvement so let's say within this table cell i want to put in a shape showing sort of how i think about how the students have done which is pretty bad so i'll put a down arrow in here so what happens i've got now a table and an arrow well we just bring up both sets of tabs both things are in range You've got your drawing tools, you've got your table tools. Everything is color-coded so that you can tell the, the things apart, that each contextual tab set has its own, has its own color. Um, so I can use the table tools to format the overall thing. I can use this to format the shape itself. If I were to grab this and take it outside of the table, now you can see the table tools go away because they're no longer in range. If I clicked in the table, the table tools would come back. Click here, the drawing tools come up, put the drawing back in the table. They both come up, click away they both leave, right? It's just, it's just that easy. So uh, contextual tabs are the thing that makes it so that all of Word fits into these six tabs, right? That's, that's the thing that allowed us to say, yeah, your feature is somewhere in here or else it's not. <laughs> and I, I li liken it sort of to this, right? Like, I never turn into like the Food Network and watch the Iron Chefs use your Swiss Army knife for cutting up sashimi, right? Like this thing is cool and it's cool in your pocket, but it sucks at sort of doing everything, right? It's a sort of a bad knife and a bad corkscrew and a bad garlic press and a bad compass, right? The new office is about being the best tool that we can be at the appropriate time get out the really great corkscrew and the really great garlic press. You're wondering why I said garlic press, right? Because there are no Swiss Army knives with garlic presses. But uh, that's why, because I have a picture of a garlic press. Uh, so, so this is you know, how we envision this. This is about you know, put the tools away you don't need, bring out the really good tools, the, the fine china, when you do need them. So the last, the sort of last part of the triumvirate of the new, of the new UI is galleries. And the gallery, is a new control in Office that we designed hand in hand with the ribbon. And it provides a visual way of browsing functionality. Wherever we can, we want to provide a visual representation of, of how the features worked. And, it, and I'll talk more about this in a second. We think of it as showing the result of the command and not the command itself. That people see galleries full of designs and full of you know, possible results and just play with them. They're fun. They say, hey, come play with me, try me out. And I don't have to know all the features behind the scenes that make that gallery work. So there's two kinds of galleries. There's a drop-down gallery, which sort of works like a fancier version of a menu today. And then there's inner ribbon galleries in that we can actually host ribbons or galleries, as you've seen, inside of the ribbon itself. Galleries are all about you can get good results without being an expert. You don't have to go to that one person who knows how table formatting works in Word to get great looking tables. However, if you are the super elite power you know, user of the century and you know how everything works, that functionality is still there. You can still get underneath the covers. And in fact, we've provided a formalized way to get from the gallery version of a feature to the more advanced version of the feature, which is always at the bottom of the gallery. So you try out the gallery. If that's not what, what you're looking for, then you can still get to the expert thing. So a really important concept when we looked at how people 
did formatting in Office. And we looked at, because formatting is a huge part of Office. We found that beginners, intermediates, advanced users tended to do the exact same thing. Something we ended up calling three-stage formatting. Right, so there's three stages to how they interacted with formatting a table. First one is apply an overall style. Like if there's an overall style available, if there's a bunch of choices, I'll try them and get as close as I can. The second one is tweak the appearance using galleries of individual effects. So imagine that I found, um, I was trying to make the no smoking symbol. Found a great no smoking sign, found a great design for that. Now I wanna add a shadow I choose from the gallery of shadows. That's the second, the second stage. And the third one is absolutely going in there to the metal and tweaking you know, the fine tuning stuff. This many pixels and the light source is coming from this direction and that kind of stuff. Not everyone goes through all three phases, but almost everyone follows them in order. And I think of it as sort of bumper bowling, which is to say, uh, bumper bowling is the thing where they inflate little tubes in the gutters of the bowling ball so that the little kids can just sort of roll it and it goes back and forth and eventually hits the pins. You can't fail with bumper bowling. Right? You sort of continue to get closer and closer to the pins until you get the thing that you want. So Jacob Nielsen caused us some consternation uh, when we showed him this, this new UI by talking a lot about something he called wiggy whiz or something, like what you get is what you see, and this whole concept of results-oriented design that people got excited about. And it's, a, it's an exciting concept, and it has a great ring to it, but it's not as big an idea as as do you think. So results-oriented design just means to us, it's really a way of us thinking about designing features. It means we think about features and not commands, right? It means that we try, in the, in the past, what we did is we built commands into the app. We built little pieces of functionality that you then constructed yourself into sort of an uber macro to do what you wanted. Now we're trying to switch to think about higher level functionality, to think about features themselves. And the, the really key thing here is illustrating features by their results. Don't show the command name. Try to think of what the person's trying to get to happen on the page and visually, responsibly show them that. Right? Actually make the feature, here's what the thing's gonna be on the page. So that users can use the gallery to get the result that they want without having to know all the junk that the developers wrote behind the scenes, all the commands. You can leave the commands there for the expert users, but hide them away. Formalize the relationship between this, the galleries and the advanced functionality. And really the thing this replaces in our mind is command-oriented design, which is what we used to do. Just like here's text wrapping and here's you know, align to margin and here's all these things that really people are trying to achieve something bigger. The other really important piece of galleries that supports results-oriented design is something that we've added called Live Preview, which, and you may have seen this as I've showed you the demos. As you hover over things in Office, we just do them in the document. So you can see exactly what they look like. So um, as you hover over the choice, it updates the document, and this stops the frustrating cycle of apply, undo, retry, apply, undo, pop the thing down. You're just like, do, 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 do. This is what I want, boom. Here's the result I'm looking for. So, so this being the third part, let me show you what this looks like. Okay, let's actually uh, open a new version of, of this document that I haven't all wrecked up. Okay. Let's. Okay, so let's go back to the picture example, for instance. So one of the things I did was I put this koala in. And I showed you this gallery that's called position. So Position is a good example of results-oriented design. So the first thing that you notice is, although the icons are kind of dumb and repetitive right now, um, that it, it doesn't try to name really a command. It's just, it's trying to articulate a need that people have, which is, I wish I could put this picture in a corner of the page and just sort of the right thing happened. It's responsive, meaning, you know, as I hover over it, I see the result actually in line, so I can sort of see what the thing looks like. And under the scenes, as I mentioned before, this is applying a whole bunch of commands, right? A bunch of line wrapping and alignment and, and, and anchoring and things like that that I don't have to know about, right? We're rethinking about the feature in the way that the user articulates to us that they're thinking about it, which is I just want to put this somewhere. The bumper bowling part of this is 
you know, maybe this isn't exactly where I want this. Like maybe I actually wanted it here, but we've gotten you close enough, right? Once you've applied the position feature, now everything's set up correctly so that you can sort of drag this and rotate it and have you know, the things that you expect to happen, happen, right? It's, it's, you get close and then you can sort of bridge the gap yourself. That's, that is one of the ideas behind results-oriented design. So another example of this, and I showed, I think, um, you know, that you can add borders, and these are live previewing over top of it. You can't really see that. Everything in the product that, that makes sense has live preview. So you can see as I'm hovering over these things that the font is changing. I can, you know, see the font size. You can see we have a nice little bug there where the fonts are getting cropped. Um, color works the same way. Just everything is very, like, you know, very responsive. You hover over it and you see sort of what it does. And you notice we're getting rid of the selection. One of the biggest problems with things today is you select something to format it and then you can't see what it looks like because the selection is on the object. So when you're doing live preview, we take the selection away so you can see what the color looks like and then when you apply it, we put the selection back. Although you can't see it very well, but this is highlighted in, in blue. So three stage formatting quickly. So here's some data that I can make a chart out of. So I'm going to go insert chart and blah, 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 blah. I don't know. I don't even remember which one I'm supposed to use. So we'll just play around. OK, so we put in the chart. And the first thing you notice is that there's a whole bunch of designs here which I can just pick from to get, you know, to get it sort of looking close to what I might want. Like, you know, oh, this thing sort of looks okay. But it's not just for designs, right? So we also have a bunch of layouts that are actual structural layouts that say, you know, I want to have a title on the top and I can see sort of what that, what that thing looks like. Um, so that's sort of the first stage, which is overall layout, overall design. The first stage of formatting is get it close. So the second thing, if I drill down, is choosing from galleries for individual items. So I could format each of these with a shadow. In this case, we have galleries of things like, you know, actually I want no title on this, and I want the legend to be, you know, on the right. So I'm still sort of at the gallery level of sort of seeing the different possibilities um, and just choosing from it, but it's not affecting the overall thing. And then finally, the third stage, if I'm absolutely, you know, anal about getting every little thing right, I can format very at a small level how everything works. So I could choose you know, one of these bars and I could say I want to apply exactly you know, this outline effect you know, to it and you know, it makes the bar look like that. So you know, the three stage formatting is something that you'll see again and again and again in this UI. Big galleries that help you get close, maybe that's good enough. If nothing else, it means the default thing you put in is going to look so much better than anything anyone knows how to make with today's office that you'll look like a hero. Um, but you, know, you can continue getting as fine grain as you want. And that's really what, what three-stage formatting is about. So customization, hot button issue. Today's you know, office, everything's customizable, super customizable. You can do almost anything you can imagine. You can remake our UI if you want. Um, but this, this customization has a price. Uh, and it, I think especially having a lot of customization in Microsoft has caused a sort of let the users figure it out viewpoint, which is, eh, we don't really have to get it right. Um, you know, people can just customize it, right? It's sort of like customization is the answer to every argument you have about design. Well, people will just pick it. We'll put both things in and, you know, let, let them figure it out. And that's how you end up with this, right? And this is just accidental. This is just, you have a lot of customization, you don't, you know, promotes a lot of accidental customization, people get a bad user experience. So then we looked at the data of how many people use all of this functionality. Well, fewer than two people is being really, really generous. It's actually very close to one. I used to say less than one, but I believe that there is the possibility that more expert users have Office 2000 now, and maybe more beginners have earlier versions, so maybe the data is skewed. Generously, let's say, under 2%. So that's a very small percentage of our user base. Next, we looked at what do people customize when they do customize. Well, 85% of them are simple adds or removes of a few buttons, right? So what are the buttons that they're adding? Well, it turns out that there's a large correlation between what they are. They're things that we should have put on the toolbars and didn't. 
like subscript in Word. Um, things like uh, send to back in PowerPoint that lets you put your, you know, your shape in the back. So a lot of these we can fix with the ribbon. Like we know what those top 20 customizations are and they're great ideas for how we should make the ribbon work. So what's left for customization? And it's something that we call the quick access toolbar. So the quick access toolbar says, hey, you get one click access to any commands that you want from anywhere in the UI. It doesn't switch out via the tabs. Um, this you can imagine is the first of the tabs and it sort of sits here. Um, you can put button, you can put anything in the ribbon up there including galleries, including you know, the groups themselves you can put up there. So if you want to put a single icon that launches a group. So you can build your own little mini toolbar. We start it with three icons that we think you'll want everywhere, save, undo, and redo. But of course, you can trash those if you want. And if you really, really want to build a big, long toolbar full of your custom stuff, you can put it below the ribbon, shrink the ribbon down, and you know, you just, as I showed you, you can collapse the ribbon and you get your own sort of custom toolbar. So I'm not going to show that now because I only have a few minutes left, but you can imagine what it looks like in your mind. Because I want to have a second to talk about dialog boxes. Are dialog boxes going away? And the answer is no. Dialog boxes remain the way to access advanced functionality in Office. Um, but in the past, the dialog versions of features in Office have been separated from the efficient version of the command. For instance, you might know where the bold button is, but there's a font dialog that has bold in it, and you have to know its font on the format menu. The two things are not together. So we have this concept of something we call the dialog launcher. And the dialog launcher simply formalizes the relationship between the group of commands in the ribbon and the dialog box that lets you get to the advanced version of that. So every group that has a dialog associated with it, for instance, font in Word, has a widget that lets you get to the dialog for font. So now there's a relationship, a formal relationship, between the efficient version of the command and the advanced version of the command. And as I showed you where there are drop downs, for instance, margins, which is a gallery that has a bunch of preset margins and you're sort of most recently used, that uh, dialog launcher is at the bottom. So that's a formal relationship between dialog boxes and efficient functionality, which I'll also skip. Three more minutes. Two more minutes. <laughs> this, is, this is good, though. I saved the best stuff for last. Flew all the way from Seattle. And... <laughs> OK, efficiency. I talked about efficiency as being one of our major goals. Um, uh, when we looked at the, 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 the SQUIM data, the customer experience improvement data for Word, we found that certain commands were used way more than others. And we've had this thing that we've tried in Microsoft a number of times called on object UI, which says put the object directly around the thing that you're trying to do. We've built a lot of really annoying features um, that do that. And that's because it's always been about trying to advertise features that you don't know how to use right next to the thing you're trying to do, like the most obscure features. So we wanted to turn that around and say, what if we put right next to your cursor the eight features you actually use the most? Would that be a more successful implementation of on object UI? And thus, something that we call the mini bar. Marketing's not happy with that either. <laughs> so so here's, here's some text, and my cursor's up here in the upper left hand corner, and I'm gonna just select some text. So you can maybe see a little ghosted toolbar has, has shown up sort of above the selection. This is the mini bar. If I move my mouse cursor closer to it, it fades in, and I can do things like bold, italic, I can make the font bigger and smaller. If I move in any other direction, other than telling the mini bar that I love it, I you know, move my cursor anywhere else, then it fades away. There's no dismiss mechanism. It's totally based on the radii between the mouse and, and the thing. So this is sort of like you know, the efficient way of, of using the mouse, just like keyboard users have control B, things like that. Um, it stays around to use it, then it just goes away. If you're totally annoyed by this, and we haven't found many people that are, even selection readers like me who select sort of as I read, you can turn it off and you can, on all the right click menus as well, we put the floaty, or sorry, there's a code name floaty, now it's code name minibar, don't know what it's been called, um, here on the context menu, and if I use it, it stays around because you're likely to wanna use multiple things on it at once and it starts behaving like a floaty, as in when I mouse away from it, it goes away. Um, of course, if I just use something normally on the context menu, 
it goes away too. So that's an example, one of the only examples I have time to show you, where we have efficient access for uh, mouse users as well. File menu, I'll talk about if there are uh, questions about that, but there is a, a new way of accessing functionality that is about the document, not just formatting the document. Um, and some of these questions I'll flash by really quickly and maybe some of you will ask them, is there a classic mode? Um, no, there's not, you can't go back to the old thing. Look and feel isn't complete. Um, and so lastly, this is my last slide, I promise. Um, you know, I just wanna, I wanna say again, the goal here is really to help people be productive with Office again. Find the right feature, discover the thing they're looking for, to be more efficient. And really, it all comes down to the documents, right? If you can easily create powerful, beautiful documents, if the software makes you look good, makes you look smart, then it's gonna have done its job. So thanks for having me, everyone. Thank you, Jensen. So I've asked Stacy here to help me with this phase of the program. Uh, thank you to Stacy. Um, so the first, we've got a lot of questions. It's been really great. Um, the first question, so there have been a number of critiques of nested menus and nested folders recently in different applications. Do you see this as a broader trend? And if so, what are other applications that you would say have kind of retreated from that idea of the nested menus? Well, hierarchical menus, which is sort of what you're talking about when you mm -hmm. say nested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so hierarchical menus, I think, are the point where menus sort of gave it up. Um, when we trace back the complexity of Office, I, I really think the place where we, where we lost it was when we stopped having menus that were more than one line down, um, where you started having a lot of, a lot of flyouts. Because there's no really good way to, to browse that, right? You basically have to create a binary tree in your head of I've visited these nodes and I visited these nodes and, and, and things like that. So um, I, I, I think there should be a trend away from hierarchical menus. Um, I think menus still work great for limited functionality programs. I don't think menus should go away. I think that though um, there should be a paradigm for software that has more functionality than what menus can comfortably hold. Did that answer that? <laughs> it's anonymous. Um, um, so this one's about uh, sort of a toss between feature creep and extensibility. Is the system more or less um, extensible? So it's great that you've reduced features, but feature creep seems inevitable. As, so as time goes on, customers will no doubt need more. How do you intend to deal with the next wave of features? Great question. So my... The way we looked at it is we're trying to build runway for the next 10 years. Will someone be standing here in another 15 years talking about how dumb I was and <laughs> you know, getting you to laugh looking at screenshots of you know, Office 16? Probably. I think that's the best case scenario. Um, wor worst case is you know, Microsoft's out of business next year. Um, I, I think... Uh, Wrong audience to make that joke. <laughs> I, I, think, uh, I think it is, it is, it is true that people yeah. will want us to add features and we'll keep adding features. I mean, that's, that's what we do. We are, for the first time, introducing a program by which we deprecate features. So one of the interesting pieces of data that we got is that we have you know, 186 trillion data points, right? And we have some features that have been clicked three times, <laughs> and seven times, and nine times, right? Uh, there are features that literally no one's using, literally. When we went to, uh, when we went to redo the options of the app, uh, which is something I'm not showing, but I could. Um, we, so there's tons of options in Word and Excel and PowerPoint, right? And so we went to look at some of the options in Excel and try to figure out what the heck they did, <laughs> and found out that they weren't hooked up to any code. <laughs> They, they didn't do anything. <laughs> so, so we can build runway, you know, seriously, we can, we can build runway for the future. We've tried to 
um, build enough space, enough scalability, enough forethought that if we can last, you know, 10 years, we'll have we'll have done our job. Um, but that that'll always be an issue, and I think we'll have to keep innovating. I don't I don't think we can go back into the stage of you know going back into a cave for another 15 years and, and not continuing to innovate. Several questions about your design process. Uh, describe the design process. For example, how did you get to the ribbon? What other options were constructed? How were these options first generated? And a related question about the team structure, the size of the team, their roles, relationship to power, et cetera. <laughs> okay, so, um, okay, so I'll first I'll do it in reverse. Size of the team, um, so Microsoft has a program manager, developer, tester, um, designer uh, team structure. Um, program managers own the interaction design in Office, which is different than how other parts of Microsoft work. Um, but in in uh, in you know consort with lots of other people, usability engineers, designers, people like that. Um, the program management team that designed the new UI, I think, is twelve people, including myself and the other lead um, developers. I think thirty five around 30 testers, something like that, 32 testers. Um, we are a shared team, and this is the first time that we've ever done UI in Office where the shared team has owned the user experience of the applications. Um, and as you can imagine, that's been a hard process because as a program manager at Microsoft, the most fun part of your job is making the UI, right? It's the thing that you can tell your mom, look, I made this button. And plenty of buttons were made just to show to mom. Right, like that, 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 that's the sad fact, is that everyone wants to make their mark. Um, and so I think it's the right process. I think having someone who is sort of separated a little bit from um, you know, the gory details of you know, the, why everything got to be the way it was, because there are plenty of reasons why everything that we had was the way it was, I think is the right kind of structure. And at the same time, the app teams are extremely vocal and important in telling us you know, what it is that they need and what, how they think about our ideas. And a lot of the best ideas have come from them as well. You know, the PowerPoint team is in Mountain View and, you know, I've been down here countless times and gotten an earful from them of, of things that they liked or didn't like. Um, so then the question is, well, how did we get to the ribbon? So day one, September 2003, you walk into the office and you're like, okay, office could be anything. What is it? And we're starting coding in January. Right, so that that is a daunting thing. Um, we had a, a, a team of designers who looked at a number of different things uh, in the beginning. I'll show a couple of them here. Um, this was, I don't know what this was. So this is sort of like menus and toolbars got combined together and there's this ring of stuff about the document that could sort of turn into this full page UI and this would sort of show how often you use the features and on what days of the week. <laughs> and, yeah, and then this would be an alphabetical list of features and you would sort them and um, I, I'm, I'm happy that you're laughing at this because you know, there were people that, that thought this would work. Um, but this, you know, we looked at things very, very broad like that. We looked at, I mentioned we looked at um, what if we didn't go as bold? What if we just added another piece? And the piece that would have gotten added is the thing called the parking space, um, <laughs> which is essentially a sort of computer-optimized list of task panes that you used recently that like, things would sort of come and go and it would cause this thing to sort of come up and there'd be some more junk down here. This is sort of the very additive approach and there, was, there were a lot of those. Um, and it could turn into sort of this more full page type thing. This is a, this is a zoomed in um, version of something that we call Tomatui. And it's called Tomatui because it has a tomatoey uh, color. <laughs> and I read the word tomatoey and thought it said Tomatui. <laughs> this is essentially the design that turned into the ribbon. This is October 2003. Um, you can see a lot of the fundamentals that turned into the ribbon are in this design. Uh, there are tabs across the top. There are groups, although they look sort of different than ours. There's a concept of galleries. There's a quick access toolbar. Um, and so, it's really, really hard to make progress in a totally ambiguous, in a totally ambiguous way, right? Like sometimes it feels like you're making no progress. 
and you have to be totally clear on your design tenets, right? And you have to be totally willing to put a stake in the ground about what you believe in. And did, did we know this was possible? Like, we sort of agreed that we thought this was design that had the most promise. Did we know that we could make Word and Excel and PowerPoint that way? No, we didn't. But you have to, you have to say, I think this is the way to the mountaintop, right? You have to put the stake down and say, we're never going to make anything unless we take a risk that this is the right way and, and this seems the most promising. So, you know, it's, I don't know how to make that process easy. It requires some element of risk. It requires intuition. Um, it requires experience. And, um, you know, you, you pick the direction you think is right and you work as hard as you can. You iterate and you iterate and you iterate and you iterate and you iterate until it's as, as, as great as it can be. So this, these next set of questions talk about the relationship between uh, the new Microsoft Office team and um, other applications within Microsoft. So uh, questions about what's the relationship? Do you have influence over them? What is communication across teams, across products, um, collaboration, competition, things like that? And people asked about uh, specifically Windows Vista, uh, Mac Office team the web user interface, so uh, IE, Internet Explorer, Outlook, um, and then there was also one question related to uh, business owners. Did you get buy-in from the business side? Okay, well that's a short one. <laughs> uh, there are many teams at Microsoft, there's not shared user experience uh, across all of them. Um, the Vista effort was underway, I mean we've shipped a number of versions of Office since the last version of Windows shipped which is to say that they've bit off a very large release. And so, you know, they're, they were essentially thought they were feature complete before we started working on this release. As it turned out, as you may know, reading the press, there was, you know, a sort of redo sort of halfway through Windows Vista. Um, we work with the Shell team, which is the primary UI team on Windows. Um, the, we don't have direct influence over them. They don't have direct influence over us. Um, we do share ideas and concepts. Some of the things have gone, you know, we've tried to sell them on the idea of live previews. We've tried to, you know, sell them on some of those ideas. And, and they've been working with us on the visual aspect of the product. So there's thinking that goes back and forth. Most of the programs in Windows, honestly, work pretty well with menus and toolbars. They have, you know, six or seven things in them, you know, rename, delete, open. And so there, we haven't yet talked about you know, what it would be like to move the whole shell over to be ribbon-based, because I think it might be overkill. Um, in terms of the other app team, so Mac Office, uh, Mac Office we've talked to a number of times. They have a big barrier to picking up something like the ribbon, which is that the menu bar is built into Mac OS, right? Pull-down menus are there on the screen no matter what. So they're thinking about how to embrace some of the ideas in Office 12 um, in their own Mac-like way. They're a separate team. Um, I you know, used to work with them, um, and you know, I used to work really on Macintosh software. Um, and they're really focused on doing the right thing for Mac customers. So that, that's, their primary, that's their primary motivation. Um, IE, um, other parts of Microsoft, absolutely we've talked about um, what it would be like to take their UI to the next level. Honestly, it's taken all of the brain power that we have available to us to make this kind of change just in the five apps that we have. Like, I would love to go do the rest of Office, to go think about how to go do the rest of the programs at Microsoft. It is, should not be underestimated, the, the challenge of, of, of converting a program this big with roots so old and so many features and, and really trying to do it right. So I think we're just at the very beginning stages of seeing how far this can go um, and, and on how many different you know, types of programs it can be applicable for. But do I think it, it will be in Microsoft? Yes. Do we have shared design at Microsoft you know, yet? No. The other question was about executives or sort of the business part of it. Um, you know, without going into that too much, I would say that I couldn't imagine working in a better environment in which we were trusted to go make the best thing. Like when I talked to our senior vice president, Steven Snosky, two years ago and said, 
you know, what, what should we do here? What's your guidance? He said, just go make the best thing you can. And we've been totally, you know, free of political pressure to, um, uh, you know, meddle or, you know, obviously there's a lot of consternation about should we let you go back to the old thing, which for various reasons is not actually possible and do a good job with the new thing. Um, but I, I can't imagine anything working better than the support that we've gotten from the executives who are probably listening to the podcast right now. No. <laughs> No, it, it's been a, it's been a, I can't imagine a better situation to incubate innovation than we've had within our team in office. I, I, I can't speak for the rest of Microsoft. Several questions about accessibility, pretty much identical questions, um, commenting that the design you've shown is very visual and mouse oriented. How will, how will Office 12 address accessibility? So our goal for accessibility um, was better or the same as Office 11. So the ribbon is, okay, so there's two pieces to this. Number one, the ribbon is fully, fully keyboard accessible, meaning not just people who like to use, you know, keyboard shortcuts, but you can, you know, you can uh, use the keyboard to navigate through it, 2D, you can use a, something called key tips, which are the way of, of uh, navigating the UI such that as I, if I push Alt, um, you'll see little letters show up that let me navigate through the UI and the different pieces there. But a really important part of, of um, accessibility is actually what, you know, if you're blind, what does it sound like when you're blind? Trying to put all the properties on there. So like everything in galleries has to have a name for accessibility purposes. Um, and we've actually gone as far to, to start thinking about um, what would it be like to say that there's an accessible interface that has no visual component on the screen, like a totally virtual interface, which is as optimized for you know mouse and keyboard, um, you know as as uh, or as as uh, for accessibility as this is for mouse and keyboard. But in general, like our our goal has been that it's better. We work with the accessibility vendors um, from the very beginning. Um, we you know have an accessibility user group who is very very vocal about telling us what works and what doesn't work. Um, so it's, it's really, um, it's, you know, as, as many of you know, you know, you have to, because of the, the, the laws that are out there, there's highly in your benefit to be the most accessible program possible. And we're not going to lose that market. So we're, we work really hard on that. There are a couple of questions here related to analysis, and they include how do you measure efficiency? How do you measure feels natural? And can you talk some about the pitfalls of the SQM data collection? How's the data analyzed? Uh, what do you track, and how do you decide what to track? Okay, great. So um, the first part of that is sort of you know what are the, what are the what are the downsides of that uh, you know of the data collection. We're really at the beginning of collecting this data and learning how to collect this data. We started by asking the questions, what did we want to know? What would be the things we'd want to know, you know, three years from now when we design the next version? That's what we ask in Office 2003. I think we've learned that we have great data in some places and not so good data in other places that we're going to build better instrumentation into the next version. Um, in terms of the analysis, um, you know, we have lots of tools that, you know, that are, that try to look at sequences and look at, you know, charts of which things are used more and which things are used less and which things are used via keyboard, which things are used very ma via mouse. But we're not statisticians. And it's actually something I interesting, which would be, you know, a usability engineer with statistical background, almost, who really can dig into that data and, 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 and find that out. So I think we're just at the very beginning of understanding how to use the data, what kind of data we're going to want in the future. Um, and you know, the pitfalls are maybe it's not totally accurate, maybe it's skewed, maybe expert users turn it on more than beginners, maybe vice versa. Um, but it's a heck of a lot better than just guessing, which is what we've been doing for 20 years. So uh, you know, I, I think we're just at the beginning stages of, of learning how to really use and internalize that data as part of our software development process. 
Um, several questions related to how these ideas about the um, uh, Office 12 UI will generalize to other apps, how uh, people will copy it. So will MS be suing people who run with these ideas in other apps? And uh, are you going to be creating an Office UI style guide? And will there be an Office UI library for other apps to use? OK, so three questions there. And my uh, answers will maybe <coughs> seem to conflict. But um, the first one is, uh, can you use it without, uh, without guarantee of, of being sued? Um, no comment um, <laughs> right now, uh, other than to say that there is substantial intellectual property in the UI. Will there be an office style guideline that would entail how other programs could use this? Yes. Um, uh, and we're working on it and uh, hope that it will be ready next year. And um, what was the third part? Will there be an Office UI library that other applications oh. can use? Um, <coughs> yeah. So it wasn't written in such a way that it can be just plugged into something else. Um, there are already third-party vendors who have already built it and are shipping it to customers, which is <laughs> funny. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, in general, uh, I, I, there's been a lot of interest, a lot of questions to the Visual Studio team about creating a .NET component that can do the ribbon. Um, I would really want to make sure, to the extent that we do it, that it's really good because you can, you don't go far from this until you're it's bad, right? The devil is in the details. And so we really want to make sure that the details were good and that it wasn't just a big toolbar. Um, there's been a lot of interest in using this in other programs. I fully expect that um, we'll have information to tell about that in the not too distant future. You know, you can check my blog um, and I'll definitely say when I know, but it's just getting the legal issues around, you know, figuring that out and figuring out how to, um, how to make that work. So, no official comment there, but you know there will be a style guide. So this is this is also related. It's, there are questions about APIs, and if you think you answered it, you could say you answered it already. Um, but this one in particular says, "Can you comment on how open and rich the APIs are in Office 12, so that non-Microsoft apps can access Office features and vice versa?" And in particular, there's mention of XML, SOAP, or something else. Okay, so big thing you should know about Office 12: uh, it changes the file format. Um, to something that is uh, XML based. Um, I don't have time to go into that. It's, it's very cool, it's open, it's licensed, royalty free, um, and you can write programs now that can get to the data in Office without even having to have Office on the machine. I mean, it's, and we have converters for read, write, all the way back to Office 2000, so we won't repeat the mistake of, of your force to upgrade to get to the new version. Um, uh, and, and so, that's part of it. XML, absolutely there. Um, we have that support. A lot of um, apps do extend the Office UI, like plugins that add UI. We have an, a, a, a major extensibility story for the ribbon. You can add your own groups. You can add your own tabs. Um, you can do a lot of the same, use the same controls, galleries, all that. Um, so we're hoping that people start doing um, an even better job of integrating with Office as sort of the host for their programs. Are there APIs available in Office for like making a ribbon in your own app? Um, no, those, those are internal. Two questions about the future. Um, what will Office 2015 look like? And what can you see happening in future releases of Word? Okay, uh, Office 2015 is based on two major ideas. No, I have no idea. <laughs> In the old days, I would have hoped to have been retired 2015, but that's not looking likely now. Um, <laughs> I have no idea except to say that, that I, I'll probably be bored if I'm still working on it then. Um, you know, if, if you looked at where Office is going, um, as I mentioned, we haven't added a whole lot of bold. We've added some bold, but so much more about Office has been about what you do with the document once it's created, building that functionality around managing documents and, and working between documents and people working together. And, and I think you're going to see a lot of innovation, not, you know, in the next five to seven years around that in Office. Uh, what features would Word add? The Word team has an 
extremely long feature list, and, and um, uh, I couldn't guess what they'll pick next. Do you have a backup plan if the new model doesn't pay off? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I got subscribed to the, I got a free membership to Baykai, and I have <laughs> full access to the job listings emails, which seems like a great resource. So I, uh, you know, maybe calling some of you. <laughs> Watch my blog. Um, no, we don't have a backup plan. I mean, we, you know, I'm sort of jesting about, about um, you know, uh, failure, and you never know what's going to happen in, in the marketplace. Um, but I really, really believe in, in, in what we've done, and we've worked as hard as we can to mitigate that risk through all the testing that we've done. Um, you know, and it's not usability testing, it's longitudinal testing. We've got companies that are rolled out on it now where real people are using it and recording videos and sending them back to us. We're doing remote site visits. We're doing events like this. Um, if, if we fail, then our backup plan is figure out where we failed. And I'm sure you know, there'll be things that we'll get right in the second version. We'll you know, continue working on it. But um, we can't go back and to the old UI because we're building features in a new way now. We don't have menu and toolbar versions of all the new features we build in Office 12. We've been thinking about features at a higher level in a new way. And so, you know, when, when we, whenever we'd sit back and think about classic mode or think about the fallback plan, we always ended up saying, well, none of the new features we're building we can really figure out how to make work in, in the old version. So, well, okay, well, what if we didn't have the new features and it was just the old features in the old way? Well, we have that product. It's called Office 2003. <laughs> and you can buy it, and you'll be able to buy it for a long time. We'll support it for, you know, decades. Um, you know, so there will be people who will choose to keep using the products we have out there now. And you know what? That, that's okay. Um, but if we can get half of our customer base to, to be excited, to see the value in this and upgrade, that would be the smashingest hit that we've had in a long time. So we know we're going to leave a few people behind, the people that you know, are more adverse to change. But we're willing to take that risk to make this bet and to try to make the rest of everyone's you know, lives better. So no backup plan, full steam ahead. Um, this, this is what we're doing. So one very quick uh, last question. Um, what are some of the things that you are not happy with in this UI? I would say the biggest hole in it is actually um, the, the, the way in which um, expert, like our super elite users, feel about it. So um, one of the things that I mentioned, I, I said, you know, we've had people come in and say they have this on their machines at home. You sort of think of, you know, basic users as being the ones who would be the most impacted by this change. But actually, they're not. They're the ones being empowered by this change. They're the ones who can suddenly do great things. Um, the people who have the most to lose are the super elite experts who customize everything and know already where every single feature is. And in fact, part of their identity is made up in the gap between them and everyone else. Like, they're the guy who knows how to do things, right? They're, they're the one who you go ask when you can't figure out how the program works. Um, and so that's good, right? That matches our goals. We want to you know, sort of empower the masses. But I think we could have done more to more special things to empower that expert user, more things to, to give them more flexibility, to give them um, you know, more. You know. We have to figure out how to do customization in a way that doesn't impact normal people, that you know, the experts can go into it and dig into it and, and use it, and um, it doesn't impact normal people. So that's one of the things I'm 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 most concerned about. Um, but again, that's you know a small, very vocal set of of users. Uh, they're highly overrepresented in our beta. Um, but even you know our beta feedback has has been beyond my expectations in terms of positive. Um, but you know, as as I told someone at dinner, you have 400 million users. The the best 
out of this world we could ever hope for would be to please 99%. That leaves 4 million people who hate our guts and hate what we're doing <laughs> and are vocal about it. And so, you know, there's, there's, there's some of that, and, um, but so much of it is, is positive and so much of even the expert users are starting to dig into it and see how they can re-differentiate themselves. Um, but, you know, I'd say that's, that's, that's the biggest risk, but, um, you know, like I said, this is not the end of the road for us. This is the beginning of a road in which, um, you know, we're going to continue to innovate in the user experience of Office. And, uh, you know, I think this model of shared user experience and really valuing user experience as the way to get people um, on new versions of Office is a trend that, you know, is just the beginning of a journey and not something that we're going to be backing down from after this release is over. On that note, thank you so much, Jensen. Thank you. <laughs>